Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. So this morning, I'd like you all to take a minute and imagine a world without data. A world where decisions are made blindly and insights remain hidden. Why would we be here? I don't know. Um, but where decisions are guided solely by instinct or past experience. What would that look like? I think it might look like that we're responding to symptoms, we don't understand the root causes of things, and we might see a lot of swings in results. But now imagine a world with less data than we have today. And I would say that was the 1980s, the 1990s, 2000s, even yesterday. We had less data yesterday than we have today. We have significantly less data. But so our investments today in data lays the foundation for creating tomorrow's insights. It's perpetual. So our industry is driven to leverage every ounce of data we have to make well-informed business decisions and guide our strategic endeavors. And in workers' compensation, we have an abundance of rich, world-class data. Some of it we collect ourselves with the Bureau data calls, and some of it is required by NAIC, and some very meaningful third-party data we connect to our data. So think about the labor market data, weather data, medical diagnosis information, and even anecdotal survey data. The goal isn't to merely accumulate the data. We're going to turn that into information and translate the information into insights. So that's our mission, to deliver more valuable and more relevant insights each and every year. And you, that's what you're going to see today and tomorrow at our annual Insights Symposium. So your past investments to share medical data and indemnity data is paying dividends, because much of what you see is that data, and we're turning that into insights to address the top industry's top concerns. So today's State of the Line will start the AIS 2024 journey to deliver insights. So our journey this morning will have four stops. And this visual give, will serve as a roadmap. And you'll see, a, here's a few previews. You're going to see a strong and healthy financial condition of workers' compensation. And we'll see a decade of similar results. You'll also see that workers' compensation premium is growing. It's near record highs. And we see a continued decline in frequency and moderate cost trends. So our first stop on the journey today is contextual. And this is going to give us a broad perspective of how workers' compensation fits into the property and casualty industry landscape. First, you see net written premium for property and casualty grew 10.4% to nearly $850 billion. So all lines of business saw an increase in net written premium. But most notably, you see premium growth in the personal lines of personal auto and homeowner, homeowners. I'm guessing each and every single one of us contributed to that growth over in 2023. But you also see here that personal auto makes up more than one-third of the total property and casualty premium. So workers' compensation net written premium grew by 1%, the smallest percentage increase that we see here. So I'd say that one of these things is not quite like the other, indeed. So in 2022, for workers' compensation, we saw a significant recovery of workers' compensation premium and getting back to 2019 levels. So what we see here is a small increase. It's in line with the industry reports that we see from CIAB, where policyholders are actually getting a flat, small positives, and small negative rate changes. But here you see premium as a percentage of the total property and casualty industry. So it looks pretty consistent to me if I'm only looking at the blue part of the bar representing workers' compensation. However, the rest of the industry has grown significantly. So in 2003, the workers' compensation share was nearly 8%. And in 2023, the share is down to 5%. 
So next we see a view of a long-term view of property and casualty industry calendar year combined ratios. And this year is the second year in a row that we see a calendar year combined ratio over 100. So over time, these results oscillate around the break, underwriting break-even point, and you'll see that six out of the 10 most recent years shows a profit. Let's look at the line results for a moment, underlying the 2023 results, and you see an improvement in personal auto, and that's offsetting combined ratio increases in both homeowners and several other lines. So property was a significant pain point in 2023, and there were 28 catastrophes that cost the industry more than $1 billion each, and that's a record because the previous record of billion dollar events was actually 22 in 2020. So together those catastrophes um, cost the industry more than $92 billion, and these events included floods, drought, wildfire, tropical cyclones, and numerous other types of severe storms. A very unique year. As for workers' compensation, we have a combined ratio of 86, a two-point increase from 2022. So within this broader property and casualty context, you see that workers' compensation continues to have the strongest profitability of all the property and casualty lines. But I'll note, though, that we're not immune to extreme weather events, that they're nowhere near catastrophic proportion. Tomorrow we have NCCI's Patrick Cote and Anne Myers and in the session that's the big three challenges for today's worker, they're gonna evaluate our extreme temperature impact analysis. Let's continue our journey through today's insights. And now that the overall context has been set, showing workers' comp relative to the other lines. So our next stop is to take a look at workers' comp results. And we'll start with a closer look at the combined ratio. So first, for some historical context. Looking back over the two decades, you see on the right the two-point increase that from 22 to 23. So the results of our pre-conference poll suggested that this is not a surprise to you because 90% of you thought it was going to be 90% uh, or lower. But it continues to be a time of unprecedented results. We have seven years in a row with combined ratios under 90 and a decade of underwriting gains. So the 2023 result translates into a 14-point underwriting gain. It's a metric of significant financial profitability. But not every carrier experiences an 86 combined ratio from a calendar year perspective. So I thought I'd give you some, ver some perspective of the variation across carriers. And 39% of carriers actually had a calendar year result that's actually better than an 86. And nearly two-thirds of the carriers had an underwriting profit, a combined ratio under 100. So the converse means that some carriers did not have a calendar year result um, under 100 and over 100. So another way to look at that is that every carrier also has a story. They have a different book of business. So if we break the combined ratio into its component parts, you can see that there's a slight increase in the most recent year's loss ratio on the bottom of the chart in blue. While the loss adjustment expense and the underwriting expense ratios are fairly consistent with last year and years before that. But we have seven years in a row with loss ratios under 50%. Next you see the investment gain on insurance transactions. And that number for our preliminary estimate of investment gain is 9%, which is below the long-term average of 11.4, but it's really close to what we saw last year. So the 9% investment gain, combined with a 14% underwriting gain, results in a 23-point operating gain for the line of business. 
seventh straight year with results over 20 percent. And in fact, workers' compensation results here you see are very strong for the entire decade. So now we're going to shift to accident year results. And you, here you see a decade of accident year combined ratios. These are the combined ratios that are reported to NAIC, and they're aggregated here for all private carriers. So 2023's accident year result is a 98. But look across the slide here, because you do not see any accident year in this whole decade that's over 100. So in blue, we bring in NCCI's estimates of accident year results. As we do our own analysis of the NAIC Schedule P data to independently evaluate and project the ultimate combined ratios. So in other words, you see here the blue is below the orange, and NCCI's selection is that we reflect the fact that we expect downward development for each of these accident years. So we're going to spend some time here to better understand how these accident years have developed over time. So first, let's look at the loss and loss adjustment expense component only of the combined ratio and see how that's emerged from last year. So this is at year end 2022, 12 months ago. And on the left, you see accident year 2014, and we show last year's valuation of 63. And you, on the right, you see accident year 2022, and that number is 69%. So now let's, 12 months later, we bring in the year-end valuations, and that's now added in the darker orange. And on the left, you see that accident year 2020, 2014 has decreased, to 62%. And you can see how every accident year has declined from last year's valuation to the current valuation. And accident year 2023 at initial report is 69%. It's very consistent with accident year 2022's initial report. So you can think of the space between these two points as the downward development that has occurred in calendar year 2023. And if I translate that to dollars for each of these 10 accident years that you see here, that makes up $4 billion that was released in calendar year 2023. And an additional billion dollars was released from accident years prior to 2014. So now you see the complete development since each accident year's initial report so the darker orange at the bottom of each accident year is still the latest valuation, and the shades of gray represent each prior year's downward development. So for example, let's focus on accident year 2017, because I think this is an interesting story. So accident year 17, you see here that the loss ratio stair-stepped down 13 loss ratio points since the end of 2017. That translates to a, a release of $5 billion in that one accident year alone. But if we sum up all of the dollars that are represented here by carrier releases, since the initial valuation of all of these accident years, the sum is nearly $30 billion. So that's the sum represented by the gray and the orange boxes. 2023 is the sixth consecutive year where we see, have seen more than $5 billion released each year. It's a sign of a very healthy line of business, but it leaves us with a question, how much more could be released? So that's next. So as we build, this is going to, we're going to start to build our perspective of the adequacy of the workers' compensation reserves. So again, we start with the latest evaluation reported by the private carriers, and that you see here in orange. We're going to bring back the NCCI estimates, and those you're going to see here in blue. So for every accident year, as I said before, an NCCI believes that the accident year will improve over time. But what you also see is that the accident years, the recent accident years, may improve significantly. So now if we focus in on 2023, it appears that it's, again, this year has been reported by carriers at a level much higher than what we believe is going to happen by nine points. 
So these nine points to us represents an expected adequacy. In this case, it's a redundant redundancy. It's not unusual because we see the 2023 gap looks very similar to our expectation of accident year 2022. And what we've seen happen for accident year 2017. So you can see that the older accident years, 2014 and 15, on the left-hand side are converging. We now look at the adequacy for each accident year, for every one accident year that you see here, and then we shade in the space between those estimates. And that's a representation of the total redundancy. So the fact that NCCI's estimates are lower, it suggests every one of these years are redundant, and as we transition to the next slide, you'll see that each, now you're gonna see each accident year's contribution to the overall redundancy. And that's depicted here with the latest accident years on the bottom to top. I want you to see here that it's notable that half of this bar, so half of the expected redundancy that we'll talk about here, comes from the latest four accident years, 2020 through 2023. And we translate those percentage points to dollars by multiplying each accident year by its premium. And we get a total dollar figure for, the, for all 10 accident years you see here. That number is a $23 billion redundancy. But think about that as a, a gross number because there's reserve discounts and we adjust by reserve discounts and discounts are considered inadequacies in our calculations here so that they, they offset the $23 billion. So the result is a net redundancy depicted by the blue portion that you see here. So for year end 2023, the expected redundancy is $18 billion. Now we're putting that into perspective with our past year's estimates of adequacy. So on this view, bars above zero represent an inadequate position, and bars below zero represent a redundant position. But you can see here that the redundancy has actually been building since year end 2018, despite the fact that we saw six years of huge calendar year results. And I'll admit that $18 billion is a very big number. It's a healthy number. It actually represents 15% of private carriers' total carried workers' comp reserves. 15%. But I want us to take a minute here to put both calendar year results and accident year results side by side for the last decade. And just take a look. 10 years of results calendar year, 10 years of accident year results. Not one result over 100, not one. So what words come to your mind when you see this? And I can say, I've said it before, re remarkable. I've also said it's unprecedented. But this year I'm gonna go stretch further and I'm gonna say it's pretty stunning. Stunning results we have here. But another word to describe it could be atypical. And we used that word five years ago when we saw five years of similar profitability. And despite all the strong indications of a healthy system, there are some concerns of a turn and some concerns of severe cost trends that, can, that will change. But let's explore the idea of a cycle and why it's still different today compared to some expectations. At AIS in 2019, NCCI described underwriting cycles and the markets that underlie them. We observed that the workers' comp industry had entered an atypical market, blending the traditional characteristics of a hard and soft market. The audience was left with a question. How long will the environment of moderate underwriting cycles last? Fast forward to today, and we still find ourselves in an atypical market. This raises a new question. Will the typical underwriting cycle return? With technological advancements and an evolving workers' compensation system, there are reasons to believe the underwriting cycle today 
is different from what we knew in the past. Looking at underwriting cycles over the last three decades, we can see workers' compensation combined ratios have moved in a downward trajectory. The better we can be at anticipating future losses, the more stable the combined ratio is. So what has been changing over these three decades? Technology and data analytics, and system maturity. Technology has grown by leaps and bounds. Computers were foundational to future advancements like the internet, software, and coding. These advancements provided the capability and capacity to process information and disseminate it quickly. Within the industry, data analytics is increasingly being used in everything from claims management to predicting loss ratios. Data analytics is helping to manage claim costs, increase workplace safety, and manage large volumes of data. Looking back at NCCI's history in the early 90s, data call validation was manual, and all correspondence was sent via postal mail. Today, all data is submitted electronically, and data issues are resolved in a matter of days. Advancements in technology and data analytics have increased the velocity, volume, and quality of workers' comp data. As technology continues to evolve, including deep machine learning and AI-powered tools, the response to changes in the market will only grow faster. But technological advancements aren't exclusive to workers' compensation insurance. So what else has changed? The workers' compensation system itself has matured. In the 90s, many structural changes concentrated on benefit levels and pricing. Sweeping reforms addressed issues such as fraud and responded to the needs of the injured worker. A move from rates to advisory loss costs expanded carriers' ability to compete in the marketplace. Today, the number of significant benefit changes is reduced and fee schedules help to manage medical costs. Over the past several decades, we have also seen a more consistent and timely filing approach, which allows us to keep better pace with trends. An increased understanding of the assigned risk market to better reflect cost differentials from the voluntary market. And a heightened focus on underwriting due to events like the dot-com bubble and a decade of minimal investment income. While the role and objectives of rating bureaus haven't changed, their capabilities and expertise have grown alongside technology. For example, with the expansion of NCCI's data streams, such as the indemnity data call and the medical data call, our data is more robust. Fresher, more granular data, combined with the benefit of a longer claim history, has allowed NCCI to provide stakeholders with greater insights into indemnity and medical costs. This has given decision makers a clearer picture of system cost drivers. Overall, these changes in the workers' compensation system have contributed to a more healthy, resilient system. Even though work comp combined ratios continue to remain low, many still remember the 20 plus point swings of the past, leading to lingering concerns about the uncertainty of the future. But it is important to remember that work comp is unique compared to the broader property and casualty industry. Work comp has a reduced level of exposure to risks faced by other lines, like social inflation, supply chain disruptions, and widespread natural catastrophes. So, will the typical underwriting cycle return? While there still may be a cycle, the severity of the past is not something we expect to see in the future. Advancements in technology and the maturity of the workers' compensation system have positioned the industry well to respond quickly and accurately to an ever-changing marketplace. <laughs> so the video gives us those in some insights why workers' compensation is different from other lines of business and perhaps why we see the strong results persisting. So I do believe workers' compensation is different, but mostly because we have a commitment from stakeholders 
to keep it healthy. And as Bill said, our systems incentives are aligned, and we have a more mature system infrastructure. You saw it here, too, medical fee schedules. We'll be talking a lot about them today. And in addition, we have, we couple all of that with world-class data. From, it starts with the collection requirements to the quality standards. It gives us volume, it gives us granularity, it gives us currency in the latest data calls. But with all of the stability we've, we've experienced, we continue to ask ourselves, what could happen to disrupt this pattern? So of course, a prolonged economic setback could. But you're gonna see tomorrow in our state of the economy session that there isn't anything really looming out there. So what else could be disruptive? So perhaps a significant disruption to the healthcare system, which makes workers' compensation injured workers have difficulty accessing care, that could be disruptive. Or something that would a change in expansion of benefits that for some reason our tools that we have today don't enable us to price them appropriately. But for now, let's come back to today, to 2023, and through our, our journey through 2023's results, and let's summarize the work comp results. We have a strong year for workers' compensation, another strong year. In fact, we saw a whole decade of similar underwriting profits. It's an era of extraordinary strength for us. Seventh year in a row for operating gains over 20%, and we have a strong reserve position with a redundancy of $18 billion. <clears throat> the next stop on our journey today is another key component of workers' compensation results, and that's workers' compensation premium. So let's take a quick recap of the components of premium. And there's two key components, and that is payroll and rate on payroll. Payroll, of course, is powered by wages as well as employment. And rate on payroll includes the bureau loss costs, schedule rating and dividends, and carrier's departure from the rate and loss costs. And those, re re excuse me, those reflect the carrier's expenses and their expected uh, profit margins. But that's the big picture, so let's get into the details. <clears throat> and first you see, um, excuse me, Here's a historical view of workers' compensation net written premium for the last 20 years. So you see private carrier premium is shown in blue and the state fund premium is shown in orange. So for 2023, the total is $48 billion, a 1% increase from 2022. It's notable here though that 2023 appears to be a near a record high, not quite, as 2018 still holds that title and it was However, it was somewhat artificially high as a result of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act back then. Let's quickly detour on the premium journey to see the residual market. And we see that premium in the NCCI service pools has been hovering at about $800 million from 2019 through 2022. And in 2023, you see another decrease to $700 million. So again, looking back over the time and looking back over the last decade where we've had such a healthy workers' comp system, you see here that the residual market has been shrinking, which is a good thing. From a market share perspective, you can also see it shrinking over the last decade to its current market share of 5%. It's a very manageable size. And what that tells us is that difficult risks are finding coverage in the voluntary market, another indicator of a healthy system. But let's come back to see more of the voluntary market dynamics. So this time we're looking at direct written premium and so that we can get a look at what's happening at the state level. So overall, direct written premium has increased 2.6% year over year across the country. And by state, in the shades of orange, show you that most states had positive direct written premium changes. Shades of blue indicate a decline in direct written premium, and you only see two states with a noticeable decline. 
So recall the premium is a function of payroll as well as rate on payroll. So let's look at payroll first. So year over year, we've had another strong year of payroll growth, and it's increased by 6%. So if you were here last year, you might have heard my comments about payroll growth then, as 2021 and 2022 had record double-digit payroll growth. 6% in context for 2023 is still rather significant. So on the left, you see that employment contributes about one-third of the total payroll growth. And the biggest gains you see here are in leisure and hospitality, as well as healthcare. And we see a small decline year over year in transportation and housing, and warehousing, excuse me. But overall, employment in this sector has been pretty strong when you consider the last multiple, several years. On the right, you see that wages are rather strong, and they're the predominant driver of the overall 6% payroll growth. And wage growth was high year over year in nearly all sectors, averaging about 4% overall. So all in all, this is indicative of a very strong labor market. So NCCI's senior economist, Stephen Cooper, will share much more about the labor market tomorrow morning in our State of the Economy session. So for NCCI states, the year-over-year -year payroll growth was almost 7% and about 5.5% for the non-NCCI states. So among the larger states, you see here that Texas and Florida had above average payroll growth, and while California and much of the Northeast had below average payroll growth. But it confirms that every state has a story. So let's turn to rate on payroll, which is predominantly driven by changes in payroll loss costs. And while this is, shows the historical impact of NCCI's rate and loss cost filings, I'm going to draw your attention to the changes that were effective in 2023, in the calendar year, and that's the 7.6% decrease. So previously we saw that payroll was increasing by 7% in NCCI states, and loss costs are decreasing 7.6% in NCCI states. The remaining parts of rate on payroll are the carrier components. That includes schedule rating, dividends, and the departures from loss costs. And you see here that the year-over-year -year change in the combined impact of all of those things is 1%. And it's equally driven by an increase in schedule rating as well as the, the departures. <coughs> this change has been rather consistent in recent years. But let's put it all together to explain the overall year-over-year -year increase to direct written premium for NCCI states. And you see that the change in payroll and the change in loss costs and mix, for the most part, counteract each other. The change in other factors is contributing to the overall change in direct written premium. And other factors, other factors will include things like changes to deduct deductible credits, changes in premium audits, and changes in mix of business, as well as changes in the average experience mod. So the overall 2023 year-over-year -year change in premium is explained. So what about 2024? What's coming? So we bring back the historical view, but this time we're adding in the changes that are effective in 2024. And the average change for NCCI's most recent approved loss cost and filings, rate filings, is a bit lower it's minus 9.2%. But this is a good time to pause and look across the full slide here, the whole time horizon. You see 21 years that are represented here. And you see only one with a noticeable increase in loss costs and rates. This is going to be the topic of our next session when I sit down with Nadej Bernard to share some insights into these two decades of loss cost decreases. And since every state has a story, you see here that all NCCI states had decreases effective in 2024, ranging from minus 19 to minus one half of 1%. But nearly one half of NCCI's jurisdictions where we do rate making are seeing double digit in decreases in 2024. But let's recap what you want to remember about our premium drivers. So net written premium increased 
The residual market remains manageable with a market share of 5%, a sign of a competitive voluntary market. Payroll increases are, remain very strong, growing 6% year over year, driven by both employment and wage growth. And all NCCI states continue to um, have decreases effective in 2024. Now we transition to our next step along the journey this morning, and that's loss drivers. And we have a lot of insights to share to, with you today here, leveraging all of our data sources. So first, let's summarize what drives workers' compensation losses. Frequency and severity are the main drivers. Severity is losses divided by the number of claims, and indemnity losses are affected by wages, benefit levels, and duration, the time somebody's away from work. Medical losses are driven by the medical service prices, the fee schedules, and the utilization of services required to treat each and every injury. Frequency is the number of claims divided by an exposure base. And in NCCI's case, we use the uh, frequency relative to $1 million of pure premium. And the number of claims can be influenced by many things, such as workplace safety, automation, employee experience levels, as well as company policies. So we're gonna start this topic with a deeper look into medical activity. Between inflation, healthcare labor concerns, and overall healthcare infrastructure concerns, this is always on your list, on the top of your list of industry concerns. So I've often said that no, there's no one number to watch when it comes to understanding workers' comp medical, and it's my intention to show you why. Today we're gonna to look at the overall change in 2023 and how that compares to other changes over time, how it compares to other medical indices. We are going to look at the medical fee schedules and how they're impacting costs, and we're also gonna just look at the overall mix of medical spend. So we estimate that the average medical lost time claim severity for 2023 will be about 2% 2 higher than 2022. The average change across this whole time horizon you see here is actually 1.8%. That is what we mean when we say that severity changes have been moderate. Over time, this is very moderate. We sometimes hear concerns about large losses, and we are asking ourselves, how do large losses impact these severity changes? So, well, that's next. And first, you're going to see here just a year-over-year -year view, 22 versus 23. And we're breaking out average medical severity at first report, so that's 12 months of date, 12 months into the, each accident year. And we break that down for claims below 500,000 and claims above 500,000. This is reported to us on call 31, and it gives us this level of detail. So what you can see here is that the claims less than 500,000 had an increase in medical severity that was about 5%, and the claims that were larger than 500,000 saw a pretty significant decrease by 16%. So for the larger claims, the severity decrease could be due to the fact that there's more claims piercing the 500,000 level, um, or it could be the fact that there's less severe large claims. And the latter is true, because it's mostly driven by the fact that in 22, we had several abnormally large losses. So the decrease in large loss severity is contributing to the moderate 2% overall increase that we see year over year. Let's bring back the view of the medical severity change over time. And this time we're gonna look at the cumulative change since 2003. So first, if you look at 2003 to 2009, you can see an increasing slope. And at that time, medical severity was growing at 5% per year. In the following period, you see it just flattens from 2009 to 2015. And since 15, you see here that it's much more subdued at that 2% per year, roughly 2% per year. 
But when we look across the whole time horizon, we compare the change in workers' compensation medical severity to the change in the personal health care index. And that's shown here in orange. The PHC is the public index that tracks most closely to workers' compensation. It generally tracks well, but let's look closer at the three time periods. So focusing first on the fir uh, first period, prior to 2009, we saw workers' comp medical severity outpacing the medical inflation. Work comp medical severity at 5%, where the PHC was roughly 3%. And so between 2009, where we see work comp medical severity flattening, medical inflation continued to grow at roughly 2% a year. And since 2015, we have seen both of these move in tandem. Work comp medical severity and medical inflation is growing at the same rate, still quite moderate at 2% a year. So we chose to show you work comp relative to the, the PHC, and it's our choice for the best index to compare our trends. However, there are many, many, many indices to watch, and there's a lot of information, a lot of data to understand and decipher about medical trends. So let's explore some of these other indices. NCCI reports the year-over-year -year change in workers' compensation medical costs based on data collected from carriers. These costs include both price and utilization. In simple terms, price is how much an individual procedure costs, while utilization is the amount of service provided. You'll hear some updates on the utilization side later today, but this discussion will focus on prices. Aside from industry data reported to NCCI, which is somewhat lagged, there are quite a few data sets published publicly that can provide us with a sense for how medical prices are trending over time. This gives us other, more timely data points to consider when estimating future medical costs. Let's walk through those data sets and take note of some key differences that are important as we think about medical prices for workers' compensation. First. Let's start with the most popular measure of prices, the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. While it's released monthly and is very easy to follow, it's too heavily influenced by things like food, housing, and gasoline to accurately reflect workers' compensation medical costs. A slightly more sophisticated option would be to just use the Medical Care Subindex of the CPI to remove the influence of non-medical prices. The downside here is that the CPI only measures consumer out-of-pocket costs and recently has been heavily influenced by volatile swings in health insurance premium prices. Going one step further, we can adjust health insurance premiums out of the calculation, leaving a much better match to the types of care used in workers' comp. This is about as good as we can get with the CPI. To include all payer types, including private insurance and Medicare, we can instead look at the Producer Price Index. The PPI measures all prices received by healthcare providers rather than just prices paid by consumers. While the PPI is a broader measure of healthcare prices, it only includes services, missing prescription drugs, and durable medical equipment, which are key categories of care for workers' compensation. Let's recap. The CPI is the most popular price index around, but doesn't include all payer types. And the PPI includes all payer types, but is missing out on important categories of medical spend for workers' compensation. Is there anything out there that improves upon the CPI by including all payer types and expands upon the PPI by including all important categories of medical spend? Lucky for us, there is. The Personal Health Care Price Index, or PHC for short, is exactly that. Published by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the PHC includes both medical goods and medical services, includes all payer types, and if you've been following NCCI research over the years, has been identified as the closest proxy to workers' compensation price changes. Perfect, that's everything we want, right? Well, not quite. While the PHC is the most comprehensive look at medical prices available publicly, 
It's only released annually and with a sizable lag, limiting its potential for tracking trends and prices. Because of that, we'd like to introduce a new series, NCCI's Workers' Comp Weighted Medical Price Index. Using the CPI and PPI as proxies for the subcomponents of the PHC, we can create a monthly index that includes all relevant care types and all relevant payer types to access real-time trends in medical costs for workers' compensation. We can even go one step further. Using our medical data call, we've weighted the subcomponents to match workers' compensation medical spend rather than the overall economy. Why is that better? In workers' compensation, medical spend is more concentrated in certain types of care as compared to the overall economy. Is it perfect? No. Unfortunately, we don't have a way to remove some healthcare costs that rarely happen in workers' compensation, such as obstetrics, pediatrics, and most cancer treatments. While not perfect, NCCI's Workers' Comp Weighted Medical Price Index does provide us with another timely data point to consider that more closely matches workers' compensation. So the video introduces our next view, and that is the NCCI Workers' Comp Weighted Medical Index. Here you see that in purple. And it's monthly look at workers' comp loss tre medical trends. So with specific weights to all of our work comp medical spend categories that's reported in the medical data call, and the monthly changes can actually help us have signals that will alert us of possible changes that are forthcoming. So we don't have to wait another year to understand what's happening in the PHC or to get an update. But now let's layer in the PHC in orange to show you how it tracks with the NCCI new index. So I think you're gonna agree that it's a pretty close match and overall when you look at these indices, you see across the slide, you see a small incline, I'm moving across the stage, small incline. <laughs> and the overall change is one and a half to 2% from 2014 through 2021. Since 2022, it's two and a half to three and a half percent, all supporting the idea of moderate medical changes impacting workers' compensation. So we're gonna to continue to track the PHC numbers because the Centers of, for Medicare and Medicaid provide future projections for us. So the latest projection from their CMS actuary says, suggests that medical trends are about 3%, will be about 3%, from 2024 all the way out to 2030. So nothing drastic seems to be looming ahead with respect to workers' compensation. And again, tomorrow morning, Stephen Cooper has much more to share underlying this new index, but also the overall inflation in the economy. So here's another dimension to consider. And so how have medical fee schedules impacted cost trends? So here we're looking at physician fee schedules as this medical spend category makes up over 40% of total medical. So first, you see in blue and purple, 34 out of 38 states where NCCI provides rate-making services have a physician fee schedule. Of the states with one, 24 of them, the shades of blue, represent states with a, at, that are, have medical fee schedules that are at least partially based upon Medicare. So now let's look at how the average cost has changed based on these groups over time. The medical data call enables us to see this level of detail and these insights and our ability to price medical fee schedule changes are direct benefits of your investments in data collection over the last decade. So first, the setup. The medical data call allows us to go back to 2012. And first, as a comparison point, let's look at all NCCI states. Over this time or horizon, you see the last decade, the average annual change represented by this, number, by this line is 1.3%. Again, moderate. So now we're gonna bring in the most effective fee schedules, those that are based upon Medicare, and you see lower physician cost trends. 
Those that are based upon Medicare are one half of 1% per year, and partially based upon Medicare is about 1% per year. And you could see meaningful differentiation in cost trends. So each line that depicts a type of physician fee schedule has lower cost trends than no fee schedule. That's shown in orange. But even no fee schedule here has 3% increase per year over this time horizon. So the last look within the medical stop this morning is to see the mix of medical spend. So let's see how this distribution has changed over time, starting with the current distribution. And we're gonna bring back 2012, and that's shown here in the lighter sh shade of color. And you can see what's changed over the last decade. And there's two meaningful shifts to point out. The shift to more outpatient and ambulatory surgical centers, and the meaningful decline in drugs. So these two shifts are somewhat expected, as so many medical procedures are now happening in outpatient settings, as well as the fact that the significant decline in opioid usage has occurred over this time frame, impacting what you see there in dr with drugs. In addition, we have a meaningful shift from, um, from private label to generic label drugs. With the increase, though, in outpatient and ambulatory surgical care, did you expect to see some kind of change with inpatient? So some of us did. I we expected a bit of a decrease there. So NCCI's Raji Chatterabian and John Sinclair will explore that later today in our afternoon session, Medical Trends, What's in the Mix? And I think some of their findings will surprise you. So finally, this view sh shows you that the share of medical spend, medical losses, has been relatively stable for the last two decades, and that medical continues to account for the majority of total workers' compensation losses. So hopefully these extra insights explaining what's happening in medical is valuable to you. It demonstrates the value of the data we have, but it's also confirmation that we can't look at just one number to tell the whole story. So let's look at indemnity average severity, and I'll remind you that indemnity, indemnity losses represents the wage replacement benefits for the injured workers. So we estimate the average change in lost time indemnity severity for accident year 23 will be about 5% higher than accident year 2022. So let's bring back that view by size of loss. Losses less than 500,000 and less losses greater than 500,000. And reminder that this is undeveloped losses, but what you see here is that both larger claims and smaller claims see about a four and a half to 5% year over year change in indemnity severity. So consistency in this view actually illustrates that there's a similar wage impact for both of these segments. So only the less predictable medical severity of large claims was putting some downward pressure on the medical number. So as indemnity benefits are tied directly to wages, indemnity severity generally increases with wages. So let's show you that. So first you're gonna see the cumulative change since 2003 in indemnity claim severity, that's in blue, and in orange, the cumulative change in wages. Both of these are indexed to 2003, and they track closely before 20, 2009, but since 2009, Changes in wage inflation have drastically outpaced changes in the indemnity claim severity. This is important as it's a key contributor to the last two decades of lost cost declines. Let's like take a look at total severity, adding the medical and indemnity components together. And it's increased from just under 40,000 in 2003 to 59,400 in 2023. This view is unadjusted, so the increases are largely a function of inflation. If we adjust the losses in, for, in the prior years for inflation, that's shown with, to you in the blue, it becomes quite clear 
the, for the workers' compensation industry has largely seen a continuous decrease in total severity since 2008. And the average annual decrease since 2008 is about 2% per year. And once we wage adjust that, you see the most recent year-over-year -year change from 22 to 23 is a slight decrease again, minus 1%. So the final stop along our journey this morning is frequency. So let's recap what we saw last year coming out of the pandemic. We saw a dramatic decrease in 2020, followed by a dramatic rebound in 2021, and it normalized last year in, in line with our long-term average. But let's drill down some more to see what's happening in 2022, so now that we have some detail. So first thing, we're gonna look at the average annual change in frequency by cause of injury since 2015. The size of the circle you see here represents the total number of lost time claims for each cause of injury. So the two larger circles, strains and slips and falls, continue to be the most predominant causes of injury, and together they make up 60% of all lost time claims. Since 2015, you can see that all causes of injury have experienced declines in frequency. But leading the pack is the larger cause of injury of strains. Let's look at another dimension. So this is the same setup as the prior slide, the same time horizon since 2015. In this case, the size of the circle represents the number of lost time claims affecting a specific body part. So lower back has the largest decline over this time period, which coincides with what we saw on strains, because strains is the top cause of lower back injuries. So it's not surprising. There's an ongoing focus to address safety with safety technologies that can help prevent workplace injuries. Later today, NCCI's Damien England we'll be moderating a panel of experts exploring the safety technology of the future. On the opposite side of this slide, you see some increases, small increases in head, brain, and face. First, we'll talk about that, and that's mostly the diagnosis of a traumatic brain injury. And traumatic brain injuries have a strong connection to some of our findings looking at mental health in workers' compensation. So tomorrow, NCCI's Patrick Cote and Anne Myers will discuss the big three challenges facing today's workers with mentions of both the low back finding as well as the connection of TBIs to mental health. The last point I have on this slide for you is the small increase in ankle and foot injuries. It is directly caused by the industry, transportation, and warehousing. That, this industry will be highlighted in the industry drill down tomorrow, to, tomorrow where NCCI's Sandra Kippist and Amanda Glish will be leading that discussion. It's time to bring in the accident year 2023 result in the most recent change in frequency. So our pre-conference poll told us that most of you expect a decline in frequency but many of us are not expecting what we're gonna see here. So NCCI estimates the decrease in 2023 to be a minus 8% compared to 2022. It's more than twice the size of the long-term average that we saw over the, over the whole time period you see here. It's quite similar to what we see in 2020 but oh, 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 so very different, right? <laughs> so in 2020, you saw the very anomalous drop in frequency due to the business shutdowns. The drop in claim counts was actually 13% in 2020. We see nothing like that in 2023. Claim counts do decline in 2023 by about 2%, but the premium growth that we use in our frequency denominator in 2022 actually accentuates this year's decline in frequency. But not every carrier is experiencing an 8% decline in frequency. 
So let's talk about some of the variation that we see. More than half of the carriers that we looked at in our data set had a frequency change in 2023 that's better than the 8% decline. 71% of carriers had a frequency decline, but not all carriers are seeing something declining, and 29% are actually seeing something increase. But frequency increases are actually seen in some industries, but just not the overall. And some in the industries where you're going to see some industry um, frequency increases will be covered in tomorrow's industry drill down. Carriers that may specialize in it, these industries could be experiencing the overall frequency increase. So every carrier has its own story too. One last look at frequency, and this one gives you a visual of how frequency varies um, by state. So this sh shows you the cumulative change since 2018, and in blue you see all states, and frequency has declined by almost 6, 17% over this time period. The other lines represented by the gray, gray lines are there to illustrate the point that some states have steeper declines than others, but generally there is a strong pattern of decline. So it's fitting to close this section with the statement that every state has a story, and it's also true for frequency. So that completes our journey stop with the loss drivers. So we went over a lot, and here's what I'd like you to remember. So cost trends for workers' compensation are very moderate and explainable over time and year over year. Year over year, medical is plus 2% and indemnity is plus 5%. And I'll remind you that wages continue to outpace the cost trends. Wages are growing at 4% a year, and when we adjust workers' comp total severity for inflation, we saw that it's actually decreasing over the last 10 to 15 years. And frequency is decreasing by 8%, more than twice the long-term average. So the overall numbers for workers' compensation show a very financially strong system. To maintain the health of the system, we continue to look well beyond the headline numbers to understand the intricacies of the system and to identify risks that may impact our future. We are relentlessly committed to being the source you trust for your workers' compensation insights. So let's put it all together and recap this, the highlights of this morning's journey. Workers' compensation has the lowest calendar year combined ratio compared to any other line of business and represents 5% of the total property and casualty industry. Reported combined ratios for 2023 are below 100 for both calendar year and accident year results. Couple that with a strongly redundant reserve position. We see a small increase in premium as a result of payroll increases largely offsetting rate and loss cost departures or decreases. And payroll increases have resulted from a strong labor market characterized by employment and wage growth. The long-term frequency decline continues and severity continues to be moderate. And as you take in all of the highlights that are captured here, I want to thank you for being here this morning, for listening, and thank you mostly for your commitment to the industry. The industry's investments in data over the last two decades are providing much of the insights that I shared today, leveraging the medical data call as well as our indemnity data call. And I ask you to remember that your investment in data today lays that foundation for creating tomorrow's insights so that we at NCCI can continue to deliver. And the system is healthy today, largely in part due to the world-class data we have to respond to changes in the system. I'd also like to take a quick minute to thank the dozens of NCCI team members that have contributed to today's State of the Line. 
Some of them are in Boca today watching um, this presentation. Some of them are remotely across the country. We have a dynamite team of experts, and I think Bill's led off with that this morning. Then the slides I shared today, the State of the Line Guide, as usual, will be available shortly on ncci.com, also available in your conference app. And it's time for a break, the first break of the day. I'll be back soon with Nadej Bernard to further understand continued loss cost decreases. Please come back.